Tom here from Lauren Systems, and we're going to talk about building your home lab rack server. Now, I know some people are just going, isn't the cloud the future? But other people know the reality is the cloud still is racked somewhere. And having your own cloud at home, having a server at home to learn on, having a rack to put all these servers that you have to learn on is, I think, a pretty important part of your IT career, not just if you're getting started, but even if you're like me and been doing this for over 25 years in the industry, I still have, even though it's at my office here, different racks and build outs that are essentially lab builds. Now, a lot of you have this at home and that's great. And some people work from home now. And so technically, is it a home lab or is it your server lab? I don't know. It, either way, we're going to talk about some of the pieces, parts and building it. This is going to be suggestions and ideas, not necessarily the only way to do it. I say that because the whatabouts come out all the time because I may not cover the favorite way you've built it. But I'm always interested in hearing different suggestions and ideas. So, you know, I'm not trying to tell you not to comment. Feel free to comment and tell me some of the other things you like besides the parts and pieces that we're going to talk about. Before we dive into all these details, let's first. If you'd like to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hires button right at the top. If you'd like to help keep this channel sponsor free and thank you to everyone who already has, there is a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you're looking for deals or discounts on products and services we offer on this channel, check out the affiliate links down below. They're in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store. We have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics you've seen on this channel. Now, back to our content. Quick disclosure to get out of the way is rack studs. They sent me these. I like them. They're pretty neat. That's the only thing that I didn't pay for in this particular video. It's not sponsored by them or anything. I'm going to be talking about their product here, uh, but they just happened to send me a bag randomly. I guess they found my address on YouTube. Anyways, we're going to start with cable management and specifically reusable ties. These may not seem like something that you think about when you're first putting a home lab together, but I can't express the importance, especially if you work with a team of people, of having everything nice and neat. Even if you're working by yourself, having it nice and neat's easy. And by its very nature, home labs are diverse and change a lot because your learning may change and what you want to learn may change. So tying it all together with zip ties means, well, cutting a lot of zip ties and doing it all over again. And I don't know, I like cable management. I know I've seen some messy labs, but if you're on the side of, I like nice and neat, these are great. I have links below to everything that I'm gonna be talking about in the video, including these, which come in a variety of colors, uh, or you can just go with the plain and normal black. That's actually my preference when I do them, but hey, my staff orders the colored ones. And it's really important when we get a bunch of patch cables out for a project, even here at the office, that I want them all put back together, all nice and wrapped, and it makes it so much easier than just dangling a bunch of wires. So it may not seem like a home lab thing, but these are definitely a suggestion. Now kind of related is this right here. I said no zip ties, but these type of zip ties are actually kind of handy. These are zip ties with a label on them. And if you're asking why would I want a zip tie with a label on it, it's actually really handy when you have cables that you don't really want to tie something to them or try to wrap a print around them. You pull this around them, you can just write a number on them. And uh, this was actually reused, that's why the numbers kind of faded. But it's a simple way when you have wires that you need labeled and you want to know where they go. Maybe you want to put the port number on here or the patch panel number on there. Uh, they're kind of handy and I'll leave a link to these. These have come in useful a couple times when we've had to label things and make things very clear. Speaking of patch panels, this is a really important part that I wanted to talk about, and it's having patch panels that are modular. These work out much better than your older traditional type of punch down ones. Now the punch down ones are still in use and they save you the trouble of having to buy a bunch of keystones. But what we have here is a modular patch panel with a couple different types of keystones. This is an HDMI keystone. This is your standard punch it down keystone. This actually allows you to connect a standard RJ45 cable to the back. And you're probably asking why would I need that? Actually, it's kind of handy. If you want to plug your servers in and you're like me and hate crimping cables, you can just, just put, put another cable in behind 
and run this back to the server and you don't have to deal with the trouble of punching it down. Someone's gonna hate me for that, going, Tom, you're just being lazy, punch them down every time. I don't know, I find it kind of convenient because I loathe punching down cables. I do it uh, very, very infrequently because I have an entire staff that is dedicated. I have a team dedicated to punching thousands and thousands of cable every year. They're really talented at it. I, I'm, I know how to do it before you um, think I don't know how. It's mostly, eh, I don't like to. But this is those little conveniences. And the HDMI one may seem odd to you. HDMI is actually really convenient because maybe you want to, and part of your lab build is using some Raspberry Pis. Happen to have one back here. And with the Raspberry Pi, they have the little delicate, tiny little cable on there. So you can run it from here down to the Raspberry Pi. That way, when I want to plug things in or move things around and switch them, I'm not dinking around trying to put it in a tiny little Raspberry Pi and run it over to here. Or maybe you just have a few different devices and you want to set up your AV equipment in there and you want it all nice and neat in a patch panel. Now, I know for home labs, patch panels are completely optional, but boy, they make things look a whole lot nicer when you have everything on the front. You're not reaching around to the back. Now, I have this weird HDMI extension. I don't even know where this came from, but I know you can buy them online. I'm not sure how to acquired here, uh, but they have a similar that I don't have in stock, a USB one that's a little bit longer cable than this, and I've linked to those. It's actually kind of a neat idea because you can plug the USB in it up front here and run those back to the server. Now, if you want to walk up to your home lab rack and plug in a USB, I wish I would have had one and think to order one for this particular video, but I thought they were kind of neat and I left a link to those. And this is kind of the point though, when you have a patch panel that is modular like this is being able to mix and match and build out a nice, you know, put some labels on it at the top and have all the things you need all in one place or buy a couple of these. And if you're an AV nerd, it turns out there's actually, I didn't even realize, banana clips and speaker jack type hookups that will fit in keystones. A lot of things fit in keystone. So that's one of the reasons I really recommend these mods are. And of course you're going to have, and I'm actually, this one's destined for my house uh, very soon. That's why I wanted to get this video done. Uh, I have some things that are going to be mounted in the rack and a few other things that are wiring from around my house. I do not have more than a half dozen wires coming from around my house that are actually hard lined in, just a couple of things. And so those will go on one end of the uh, keystones with you know, your standard punch down style. And then the other ones will be, well, the different things in there just to keep things nice and neat. And I'll be doing a separate video on that after I build it, but I wanted to cover some of the parts I'll be using. Now, the next thing is mounting all of this in a rack. And I'll cover the rack in a second, in a little bit more detail, but I wanna talk about these rack studs versus cage nuts, and they're pretty cool. Now on this side, here's your traditional cage nuts. And uh, anyone who's looking at these is probably looking at their fingers and thinking about just how much they've tore up their thumbs, pushing these little guys in. They can be, well, somewhat tedious. Let's get this in here real quick. And I've already messed up a little. Let's see if I can squeeze it in. Oh, come on. And yes, they make a tool to make that easier. All right, I've squeezed it in, but obviously I'm holding this little piece in a way that is really simple. So I can put this in, but when it's in a rack and maybe something above it or below it, it can be a little tricky getting these in, but these are solid, they're heavy duty. If you have something heavy, I like your standard cage nuts and they go in just like that. So now let's talk about the rack nut method. And for a lot of the lighter weight things, I mean, they're plastic, so I don't think they're gonna hold up quite as much as these, but boy, these come in from the front. So that's the first thing that's gonna make them easy. So they go in like this and then a little tilt. That's it, that was in. It is real easy. You don't have to get behind it. You don't have to hook anything up. It will pop right back out. You can put your finger back on here and push down, rock it right back out if you wanted it out, but we'll just keep this in. Then we have this little keeper piece and this keeper piece goes like this. And if you can see how that end goes in, this end is gonna push right into that. So you, you can put them on backwards, but they won't look right and uh, they won't fit in properly. So be careful that you get them right. And what this is doing is holding this so it can't pop back out. And then you just spin these on with whatever you're going to mount. So we'll go ahead and spin this little thing on. And when it spins on, you'll actually see the gap close and this now gets nice and tight against there. And that's it. It's real solid, it's a good piece. I like the way these hold up and because these are thumb screws, especially if you're a home lab and moving things around, 
you don't have to go find a screwdriver because these are not thumb screws, they're standard traditional screws. So I still use these where things are heavy and if it's heavy and gonna be in there and have a lot of weight on it, maybe an old server you have or just a heavy large storage array or a UPS especially, if you have one of those in your rack, you'll know those are I don't know that I'd trust rack studs to them, but I might do a separate video on just how strong these are. Now, this StarTech rack that I'll be covering, there is two styles of rack stud, and I mentioned the StarTech rack because they have a wider one, depending on the thickness of the rail, and a narrower one. The red-ish colored ones here, burgundy, red, I don't know, I'm not a color expert. These ones definitely are uh, the right size for the StarTech, but please note the purple ones are a little bit wider in the way they fit in rack thickness. They'll work in the StarTech, it seemed to work, but it seemed also be a little bit too big. Uh, these are the ideal size. I guess there's a couple different millimeters that's listed on the bag of the rack studs. And even when you put the plastic thing, you gotta wiggle a little to get that back out. You can then push on this and easily pop these right back out. Well, almost easily, there we go, kind of easily. Not too hard to do. All right, now, now that we know how we mount some of these things with these rack studs, and I'll start with something heavy though, because heavy is where I do recommend using the standard metal ones, because uh, they work really well. And heavy is the servers. And I know home labs are less than ideal when it comes to having perfectly working rails that slide in and out. This is a challenge. This is where these solve that challenge. And I got a couple mounted already back here. Uh, these are made by Navepoint and I've got a link to them. They are adjustable trays essentially to set the servers on. Now you can get them to different sizes. You figure out the depth of your rack. The StarTech rack itself is also expandable and they work wonderful for servers that are well without the proper rails. And if you're like me, I get different servers in that I review and we slide them in and out. And by the way, despite sliding them in and out, and this has been in here for a couple of years, uh, there's hardly even any scuffing on them. The metal coating on them stays up really well. Not that it matters, but aesthetically, you know, it's not really that scuffed up. And for being able to slide in a server and you know, not having to worry about trying to mount it each time. That it just, it, it's a simple process. And like I said, they're adjustable to whatever depth you've set your rack. The specs are down below. You put all the screws in here. And I do really recommend one thing though. And you'll notice I've done that with these. There are all four screws in it, not just two. I mean, it probably can hold quite a bit of weight, sheer weight when you put it in with just two. But the reason you really want to put four is if you only put it with one, and you set the server in like this and it'll kind of tilt down because there's nothing to hold that top part in. So you do make sure when you put these in, you put four in and four in the back because if this starts coming in like this and because of the way these are, it may the server may catch on the screws going in because these will tilt in and you'll get it stuck and it'll be very aggravating. Save yourself the aggravation so you're not standing there mid holding a server and dealing with that. Now. For the next piece, the StarTech 25U rack. Now this is expandable depth, 25U height, but expandable depth, which is really convenient because, well, you may have different needs. I've actually got one switch mounted on back if you're wondering what's over here. Uh, that's easier for the 10 gig switch because of the SFP cables. I didn't want to bring them around to the front. So it's, you know, symmetrical. So either side you want to use, you can use it. It's actually the same either way but this is what I consider the front and versus the other side, which is essentially the back. Now, one thing I have done is add this piece of OSB board to the top. Well, I didn't add it, my staff did. They went to the hardware store, bought a piece, painted it black. It's only got a minor chip here. This is really convenient to have on top. Uh, it's bolted down to this. I really do like this as an accessory to having it right on top so we can just set the things on here. The only downside is occasionally it ends up being a uh, place where they stack things they're not sure where to put and a lot of stuff ends up there. Now you may notice, and I'll show it from the front now because so you can see it in action, yes, it'll shift a little bit, nothing, there's like a stop to this, but yes, it will kind of, it's tight, it's well built. I don't feel bad having it doing this. I put some really heavy equipment in there, but it's basically the little bit of gap between where these bolts are, but uh, this is not hard to assemble. Actually, I've, uh, I'll show a video real quick. Me and my, fun, my son assembled this. It happened relatively fast and it's still really solid. It's no problem putting heavy equipment inside of here. 
Now let's talk about some of the other details uh, and power seems like a good one to start with. Power is fed to this through this ADJ PC100A. Now it's not bad, I like the fact that it's got the numbers on it and it's lit up so I can turn things on and off as needed. So if I want number seven on or off, no problem. Also completely related is the way I have things labeled. And we'll pull one of these around from the back here. We put little labels on the power cord. I probably should use those zip ties I mentioned, but I know power five goes to this particular plug. Now there's just standard plugs on the back of this, but this makes it really convenient when you're doing things. I don't know which server is gonna be plugged in when because well, there's a few empty spots for whatever I'm gonna be testing next and having each one labeled, that way I can turn them on and off kind of on an as needed basis individually. That's what makes sense for me. Now I will mention, it may not make sense for you, so I do have, because this is what's going in my home, is this CyberPower CPS1215. And uh, I like this device. It has plugs on the front, plugs on the back. And this works out well when you don't need to turn off everything individually. You just need one switch. They also put the little click on there so you uh, can't accidentally bump this once it's closed. It's either in the on or off position really long cord and like i said i've linked both of these down below whichever one works or maybe some combination this obviously only has plugs on the back side and looks nice at the top of the rack and i don't want everything on all the time especially when i have noisy servers in here i turn them off when i go to record and maybe turn them on later we have some things that are kind of more statically in here so that's why they have a label above but at home uh, for what i'm doing at home i have the same rack and i'm just want power all the time and this having cords both front and back lots of places to plug things in whatever i need to hook up and uh, i'll probably mount it on the back side of the rack at home to feed everything now let's get to something that drives me absolutely crazy and if you work at all in the technical field it has probably driven you crazy too and that is shelving it is important to buy these so you can save yourself so much aggravation. What happens is not everything will be rack mountable that you have. Your cable modem and many other things that you may end up with, such as this Synology or this TrueNAS. That is not a rack mount, obviously. And I know some people will just do this and they'll just set things on top of whatever is rack mounted with a flat surface. And please don't do that. I have walked into so many unprofessional looking offices where they've just stacked everything on top of a switch or in this case an MVR. And then if you ever have to remove switch or MVR, you have to figure out where to put all the things that they had on there. These are not that expensive. You pop a couple of these in and now you have a nice shelf to be able to do this. And they do come in larger varieties. This is a pretty deep one here. I actually prefer the bigger ones because that way you can just set whatever power cords go on there. I like the slotted ones as well because, well, sometimes I'll actually zip tie a couple things to it to make it nice and neat and tight so nothing can just fall off the back. No one can accidentally pop a cord and pull it off because, well, cable modems, it's just easier if you put it all and you make it take the time to put it all nice and neat on one of these. It'll save you so much trouble and they'll hold a pretty good sizable amount of weight. Matter of fact, if you do put a sizable amount of weight, I'm curious, and maybe I'll do this as a secondary video, I'm curious at what point the rack studs will break. I thought about putting these on there, actually, I'm doing this, and testing rack studs versus a standard style cage nut and putting some weight on there and seeing at what point these will pull apart as I am a little bit curious about that of how much weight it will hold. Not how much weight it's specified to hold, but how much weight it will really hold. Uh, leave some comments if you want me to actually do that video and I'll be more inspired and bold to do it. Now, the last thing I wanna cover is gonna be the patch cables. And there is these thin ones right here. These are actually very normal ones right here for patch cables. These thin ones are kind of cool. These slim ones are really cool as well. And there's different ways to handle it. Now, I have a separate video I'll link to that I already did on all the different varieties of the patch cable. Once again, that's something that comes down to opinion and budget and what you have, what you have available. But if you have the opportunity to buy them new, I really will just tell you, if you don't feel like watching that video, I love these slim ones. We've been doing a lot more uh, with the slim runs because they work really well. Yes, and there's an entire debate on those videos of whether or not you can run PoE over a thin cable. Yes, you can. And uh, as long, I mean, there's limitations, but we discuss all that. And I have a follow-up video where we break down cabling standards. I'll leave a link to those. So if you want to dive deep into overthinking cabling standards, um, I actually got the person who did the standards. It's a great video to watch. Uh, he's someone on the board for certifying things. So it, you could say he's the expert on this. But uh, patch cables, there's 
plenty of different varieties out there, but I will tell you for doing your home lab, once you go to these thin cables, you just don't want to go back. They're just way easier to manage. I actually had more from over here. My uh, staff have wandered them off into the other room and taking them kind of as they needed. So I do need to buy more. That's why there's still these ones in. And, uh, but yeah, definitely helpful. Uh, other side note, I do, and I'm missing two of them because once again, someone took them. And uh, these are blanks that I have in here. It does look nice. And these are not that expensive when you're, if you're really going to get tedious with your home lab, uh, blanks to fill in any ones that aren't used. And of course the different color varieties that I have up here. Really handy when you want to identify where things come in. And for those of you that just go, hey Tom, what is this? This is actually how I tap into the 10 gig link. We have dual links going back from here to the back of the office where our 10 gig is. But this is a way I test other 10 gig switches. When it does this, it goes to the 10 gig switch there. But when I have another 10 gig switch on a table, that's why it usually gets plugged into this white one being the 10 gig. So just because I know someone will ask why there's a little loop on this and why I have it plugged in that way because it may seem silly to you, but you know, it doesn't to me. It is also handy for things like this upcoming video on uh, doing port tapping and sniffing. It really doesn't matter what switch you do, with, do it with, but it's handy to have these in the front so you can tie in your port tap and you know, get things set up real quick. But as I said, I'll leave links down below to all of this stuff. There is always interest I have in learning what other things you may suggest. And maybe if there's a follow-up video of questions I didn't cover, why you love or hate some of these things, but you know, happy building, man. This is, it's a lot of excitement and um, a lot of fun to do. I want to play more with some stuff. So I'm going to start sticking it in here and, uh, Bonus of the way these rack studs work, uh, they are long enough so things will kind of tilt and hang in there if you're putting them in by yourself. But let me know if there's a few things you want me to review or talk about and I'll leave comments below. I always go, like reading and replying to them. And of course, uh, this will be posted over to forums where we can have a more in-depth discussion. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time. <laughs> this is what the rack's really for. We're just going to roll around the basement in it. <laughs> Can you skateboard it? <laughs> there you go. Can you do tricks on it? Ollie. Can you? And you ollie it. That's what we really need to know here. Oh, that hurt. <laughs> yeah.